Hello, my name is Brennan Angus, and today I'm going to be doing a presentation over the applications and the theory of the FFT. So, an FFT is a fast Fourier transform, that's what the abbreviation stands for. Um, it's within the category of a discrete Fourier transform, and the Cooley Tukey algorithm is the one that we're going to be talking about today. It's still one of the most popular fast Fourier transform algorithms and it was published in 1965. Other algorithms that are fast Fourier transform algorithms include prime factor algorithm and Raiders FFT algorithm. Those are just two that are commonly used in MATLAB. So one thing that's interesting about the Cooley Tukey algorithm is that Tukey and John F. Kennedy's committee of the John F. Kennedy's science advisory committee were discussing possible methods for detecting Soviet Union nuclear weapons tests with the issue being that obviously they can't send someone into the Soviet Union to lay eyes on testing happening so they had to come up with the means of putting a type of sensor a seismic detector outside of the Soviet Union and during this meeting Tukey had the initial idea for the Cooley-Tukey algorithm, and he was paired up with Cooley to create the algorithm. And the funny part of the story is that Cooley never actually knew the actual purpose, though after it was invented, it was put to a lot more applications than just the nuclear weapon detection. Um, again, this is just one of the most common fast Fourier transform algorithms. And also, uh, discrete Fourier transform discrete Fourier transforms are just one of multiple transforms. Um, there's discrete Fourier transforms, continue Fourier transforms, Fourier series. There's also Laplace transforms and Z transforms. But today, what we'll be focused on is purely just the discrete Fourier transform um, with the formula shown here. And we can see it written in different notation here with this little connector to describe omega k connected to the formula on the right. And as we can see, it's common notation that capital N represents the number of samples in a unit that's used in the Fourier transform. And I'll be sticking with that notation today. So, to get into the fast Fourier transform, we need to do just a bit of complex number review. This is our formula, just rewritten here, and any complex number with a magnitude of 1 can be written as e to the power of j theta, where j is the square root of negative 1. And e to the j theta equals sine theta plus j cosine theta, again the magnitude is 1. And it's periodic with period 2 pi, just like sine and cosine always are, and we can see what e to the j theta looks like here. It just traces out a unit circle counterclockwise as theta increases and we're still using capital N for a period and I'm using capital M to describe any generic integer. So we also have W sub N which is common notation for e to the negative j 2 pi over N power and we can see that for whatever subscript W has it just breaks up the unit circle into that many chunks. So W sub 4 would be on each of these four points where the axes meet the circle. So, again, before there was the fast Fourier transform, there was just the plain original discrete Fourier transform. So, a couple examples here. We have a two-point DFT where I went ahead and just did the direct method to get these results here. And then a four point is very similar. It's just a longer summation over four points. And we're left with four equations. And this leaves us with a matrix of our results equaling this matrix we made from these times our input values. But it might be hard to tell what this pattern actually is but what it is, it's tracing out the unit circle counterclockwise um, by powers of 1, going a quarter of the circle at a time, by powers of 2, and by powers of 3, which is harder to understand until we look at the generic form, which shows us. This is W sub M for any integer M, 
like we saw earlier. And the first row just moves by powers of 1, the second row by powers of 2, and on. And the important takeaway of the brute force method is that the runtime is O of m squared, where m is the dimension of these matrices. And it's O of m squared because that's the runtime for multiplying a square matrix by a column vector. And we can also tell by looking at this matrix that there are going to be lots of points that have the same value at different places in the matrix that we're doing multiple calculations on, which seems inefficient because it is. So now on to the actual star of the show, the Cooley Tukey algorithm. First, a few assumptions. Um, a common assumption is that n, the number of our period, is two to, is a power of two, or just any generic highly composite number, but by far making it a power of two is the most common assumption. This leads to simplicities with doing the transform and gets it takes care of uh, preventing issues that come with having something that isn't highly composite, which we won't be going into detail of today. And also that the signal is periodic with in samples. Um, this is because in the discrete Fourier transform, it's done over one period and mathematically, it actually assumes that the signal is periodic over that span. So here we can see the original formula, where n is a highly composite number, or in this case just any composite number, r1 times r2. And this, on this whiteboard here, is directly how it was described in the original documentation of the cooley tukey algorithm. I added a few more details just for better understanding, but all of the math comes directly from their original documentation, while variations, of course, have been made since the 1965 publication. So n is a composite number, and then we make uh, our lowercase n value equal n1 r1 plus n0 with this range of n0 and this range of n1, and we do something similar with our k value, excuse me, while these are the inputs to our original function, k is, and our transform function, um, n is the input there. So these formulas are quite confusing at first glance, trying to think of how they come up with them or how it makes any sense. But if we remember that n equals r1 times r2, meaning that our maximum value is r1, r2, minus 1, we can check this against these formulas and take our n value, make it our maximum that we're calculating. It's going to equal the maximum of our n1 times our constant r1 value, because it only has 1, plus our maximum n not value. And if we do those computations using r sub 1 minus 1 and r sub 2 minus 1, we do see that the maximum value matches what we expect it to be based purely on capital N. And the same goes for K here. So if we put in those substitutions, we have a function of N1 and N0, and this is the series that it gives us. So let's notice real quickly that we have a series inside of another series with R1 add-ins on the inside and R2 add-ins on the outside. So that means we're adding up R1 terms or add-ins and doing that R2 times, which again matches our total number of add-ins being R1 times R2. And F is a function of K1 and K0 and this is how our w sub n gets broken down, given that it's n times k, with k being k1 r2 plus k0. We can just split it up because exponents adding translates to the bases, or the whole unit with the exponents, multiplying. 
To simplify this further, we use the fact that w sub n raised to the power of lowercase n k1 r2 equals w sub n equaling lowercase n not k1 r2. This is a provable property of complex numbers that was just directly given in the original documentation, but we're, we don't need to go into detail about the complex arithmetic that is behind that. So with that substitution, the inner sum k1 can be defined as an array. And we can simplify this series, excluding this outside w sub n factor to be f sub 1 of n naught and k naught. This is just the series over k1, f k1, k0, w sub n raised to the n naught k1 r2 power. And that's made different from this through knowing that these two are equal because of some complex number properties that we're taking advantage of behind the scenes. So if we take that substitution and plug it back into our original formula, where our inner series is made to be F1, we multiply by W sub N to the original powers. Again, I just add these because the bases are multiplying. So we're multiplying it by the original and taking away the power to which it was raised on the inside. Because now that we have F sub 1 already in here, that factor is in here, I tacked on the original factor and I have to get rid of what this already has inside of it so it's not extra. And when we plug that all the way through, we end up back at a form of the original computation with omega sub n to the power of n1 r1 plus m0 times k. What's important to note about this is that there are n elements in f1 with each requiring r1 operations so the total number of operations required for the computation is n times r sub 1. And n, sub, n times r sub 2 operations are needed for f, calculated from f1, meaning that the period for computation equals n, our number of elements, times r1 plus r2. That's the total number of operations, excuse me, where r1 and r2 are any factors that multiply to our overall period. So here the example only used two factors, but this principle can be expanded. So remember I said we can make a general assumption that the convention is to make our value a power of two. So in most cases, these different R values, however, however many there may be, will be 2. So when n equals the product of all of these r values, the time it takes will be proportional to the sum of those factors. And then if we make all of those different r values equal to each other, one constant value for anything but commonly 2, n just equals that r value to the power of m, because it's multiplying r times r m times. And then if we take a logarithm on both sides, we can see that m equals log base r of n. And the total number of operations is r n log of n. It's categorized in the runtime o of n log n, as constant factors aren't um, considered in big O notation for runtimes. So, looking at the runtimes, we saw earlier that the brute force Fourier transform has the runtime of O of n squared, while the Cooley Tukey algorithm has a runtime of O of n log n. And if we look at this big O chart, we can see how big of a difference that makes. The n squared and the n log n, these are 
generic forms, have quite a substantial difference in the runtime per number of elements growth rate. So here we can see for something like in factorial, the number of operations increases drastically, even with very few elements being added, and the better run times are lower, like a constant log of n, in, and so on. So this allows for arrays with much higher or many more values to have computations done on it more quickly, take up less time. It's still not the best runtime of any algorithm, but it's substantially better than what we started with without the algorithm. Here are all my sources. Thanks for watching.